As we delve into the history of feral swine in America, we discover something that very few people know to be true. Do you know where wild boars originate from? In the 1500s, these colonists had several reasons for bringing wild boar from Europe to America. One of the main reasons was food. Pigs were a valuable source of protein that could be raised relatively easily and provided a sustainable source of meat for colonists. In addition, pigs are known for their ability to adapt to new environments and forge food, making them a valuable resource for the early settlers. They are also used for hunting because they are often released into the wild to breed and establish populations that can later be hunted. Today, feral pigs can be found in almost every state in the United States. Texas has the largest hog population, currently having about 6 million wild boars in the United States, with more than 2.6 million wild boars in Texas alone. These animals have adapted to new environments and can thrive in a variety of habitats, from forests to wild swamps. Pigs damage crops, spread disease, and can even pose a threat to humans and other animals. Many attempts have been made to control their populations over the years, from trapping and hunting to aerial shooting, but have been unsuccessful. They are omnivores. They will eat varieties of food sources, including plants, insects, small animals, and carrion. Their keen sense of smell and nighttime activity make them effective foragers by using their powerful snout to locate food. Pigs play an important role in the food chain. As both prey and predators, they are the main food source for many large carnivores, such as Komodo, bears, wolves, and big cats. Wild boars will roam their territory in search of females in heat. When the wild boar finds it, it will fertilize her. After pregnancy, the female will seek out a safe and secure area to give birth to her litter of piglets. Unlike domestic pigs, wild pigs will leave their cubs in a safe place and go to feed, then return to feed the cubs.
After the piglets are weaned, they will join the mother and other members of the pig group and forage for food and shelter from predators. A group can range in size from a few individuals to over 20 individuals, with females and their young often forming the core of the group. Male wild boars are usually solitary, but they can also join groups during the breeding season for behavioral and social understanding. Their presence in the United States has had a significant negative impact. Wild boars cause more than $2 billion in damage to crops and property each year, with damage to agricultural crops accounting for approximately $1.5 billion. Of that total, in some areas, Texas feral hogs have been estimated to cause more than 50% damage to crops like corn and soybeans. Additionally, they trample and consume crops, leaving traces that can take years to recover and can also damage irrigation systems. Their behavior can also cause soil erosion, which can lead to sediment runoff and water pollution. All of these factors can have a negative impact on the environment and surrounding ecosystems. The problem of feral swine overpopulation in the United States has prompted various government agencies and organizations to take action. Because of the animal's intelligent adaptations and nocturnal behavior, hunters and trappers must be skilled and experienced to successfully capture wild boars, and they may need specialized equipment such as traps and trained dogs. Many states require hunters to report their wild boar harvests, to monitor population trends, and determine the effectiveness of feral hog hunting. A high-strength electric fence is the most effective type of fence for this purpose, as it can withstand the strength of wild boar. The height and strength of the fence are important factors that determine its effectiveness, as wild boars are very strong and can jump over low fences. Therefore, the fence must be at least three feet high and made of sturdy material. These animals have proven to be incredibly resilient and adaptable in the face of environmental change and human activity. These animals have left an indelible mark on the American landscape. Whether you are an American or not, what impression did this video leave on you? Please comment below to let us know. Let's continue watching more videos, guys. Invasive animals have always been a problem for governments and farmers. In the United States, in addition to common invasive species such as white-tailed wild boar, deer, and coyotes, 
The natural landscape in the United States is also affected by countless other invasive species, such as swamp rats, Canadian geese, raccoons, wild turkeys, and wild horses. To limit the negative impact of invasive species, the United States government often encourages affected people to use measures such as setting traps to destroy habitat or hunting these invasive species within permitted ranges. The foreign geese is one of the most common wild geese in the United States and North America. It is estimated that there are at least 7.3 million Canadian geese living in the United States today, and they are wild animals that cause quite a bit of trouble for farmers and the U.S. government. The beginning of March to the end of May every year is usually the time for Canadian geese nesting and laying eggs. Nests are often made right next to water bodies such as ponds and lakes or swamp. On average, each female Canadian goose usually lays about five eggs and these eggs will then be incubated for about 25 to 32 days, depending on weather conditions to hatch Canadian goose eggs. Incubation will be done by both males and females. Immediately after hatching, these geese can forage on their own, and their diet is similar to that of adult geese. In recent years, California, Oregon, and Minnesota are the states that regularly record large numbers of Canadian geese coming to nest and breed in grasslands. Because grass is the favorite food of Canadian geese, Flocks of Canadian geese roam the grasslands of the United States very often. The fact that dozens, even hundreds of Canadian geese forage in the grasslands is also one of the problems that many people worry about. Canadian geese will live with their parents for about a year before becoming independent and they will need about three months to learn to fly and be ready to migrate with the geese. Wild geese are the favorite prey of carnivores, such as foxes, coyotes, and crows. Currently, due to rapid urbanization in the United States, parks and artificial ponds are often favorite places for geese. The fact that dozens or even hundreds of geese live right next to human habitation has caused a lot of trouble and this is why they are considered one of the invasive species of the United States. Geese are very prolific and poop profusely. These presents will poop every 20 minutes, and on an average day, each adult goose will poop up to a pound and a half. Having a flock of several dozen Canadian geese living in the park would make the park destroyed. In addition to their droppings, will make lakes and grasslands quite polluted. This not only causes problems in man-made grasslands and lakes, but flocks of Canadian geese can also endanger flights. It is estimated that every year around the world there are about 1,200 plane crashes involving geese. At some golf courses in the United States, workers use drones to scare away geese before a game. Given the problems of Canadian geese, we can't ignore the noise pollution this animal causes during breeding season. Geese will fight each other for the right to mate, and this is where they make a lot of noise if you're not used to it. These sounds will most likely upset you, and you'll want to do something about these geese. Every September and October, thousands of Canadian geese fly south to escape the cold of the season. 
the geese migration may stop at the pasture to replenish energy before continuing. This is also a big problem for grain farmers because thousands of geese can cause significant damage to their crops. There are many solutions to deal with Canadian geese in the United States. In particular, allowing hunters to kill the goose is a solution that has received a lot of sympathy from people who are not sympathetic to this animal. Catching and butchering geese is a short-term solution done in late June and early July. It is usually the time when Canadian geese go to malt. This is also the time when they can't fly, so it's easy to collect and catch them at this time. Many charities do this in the United States, and the goose meat is then distributed to needy families. Next, we will go to the U.S. state of Louisiana to see how to deal with swamp rats. The swamp rat also known as the nutria, is a large 20-pound rodent that lives in the coastal marshes of Louisiana, which is now widespread throughout the southern United States. Swamp rats are considered an invasive species of becca. They often eat the roots of the swamp to the point of no chance of regrowth. They can eat strips of marsh overnight, leaving empty water in their path. According to the United States Wildlife Service, an adult swamp rat can give birth to 40 to 60 young per year. This makes populations of this animal a constant threat to the ecology of wetlands. Currently, many parks in Louisiana are full of swamp rats, and visitors often have the habit of providing food for them. But as recommended by animal experts, providing food for swamp rats can cause their numbers to increase rapidly and this will harm the park's landscape. To deal with this invasive species, trapping and hunting are two commonly used solutions. To encourage people to kill swamp rats, the Louisiana government issued a $6 reward for each swamp rat killed. After hunting swamp rats, hunters will cut off their tails and bring them to receive rewards. In addition, the government in the United States also strongly encourages chefs to add swamp rat meat to their menus to reduce the number of this invasive species fast. In addition to Canadian geese and swamp rats, wild horses are also considered a problem for cattle ranchers in the United States. The wild horse population has shown growth at 18 to 20 percent per year over a wide and overpopulated population. Cattle ranchers in the United States are the ones most affected by the feral horse problem. To solve the wild horse problem, the Bureau of Land Management gathers and removes feral horses from public lands to protect the health of animals and the health of the nation. In some locations, the Bureau of Land Management also uses contraception to slow the growth of wild horses. We still have a lot of videos about American agriculture. Hello, and see you in the next videos.